that has been a request of Rakesh Jadav. And thank you, Dr. Shantanu Gua. This is a really a very wonderful meeting, always loved by everybody. A very pertinent, very good questions has been asked. And I was assigned a cardiovascular manifestation during COVID and post COVID. And I will be highlighting more on post COVID manifestation. We all know that this disease is caused by SARS CoV 2, and it is a beta coronavirus, and it enters into the cell by the S2 receptor. And Akesh, one second, like sir. like SARC-1, which has outbreak in 2012, and Middle East or MERS COVID, which is in 2018. Rakesh. These are the common symptoms. And I think every day you one add one more symptoms. Fever, cough, myalgia, fatigue, expectoration, dyspnea, lymphopenia, sore throat, diarrhea, even at now they believe that few strain is causing more diarrhea, abdominal pain, dizziness, headache. These are the all common symptoms by which Dr. Rakesh, of the patients of COVID. Dr. Rakesh, uh, one second, sir. Just, uh, In severe cases, yes, pneumonia, ARDS, ACS, cardiac shock, increased risk of co-infection, SCD, and stroke are the main culprit. The most important thing that COVID illness is not, not limited to just index event. Delayed and persistent symptoms has been observed in the survivors, irrespective of their severity at initial illness. Therefore, COVID illness has been divided into three parts by CDC, acute lasting up to four hours, four weeks, ongoing symptoms of COVID-19 from four weeks up to 12 weeks, and post-COVID syndrome when signs and symptoms continued beyond four weeks or they develop after 12 weeks. We all know these are the acute comorbid condition which increases the mortality and morbidity in acute COVID infection. And if you have either CVD or diabetes, comorbidity, it increases the risk of death by about 12 fold, 12 times more. As far as acute cardiovascular manifestations and clinical course of COVID-19 infection occur, the first and foremost is that if you have a cardiovascular disease, you are a hypertension, you have two, these are the two important comorbidities. And they increases the acute illness morbidity and mortality to much higher extent. When you have a severe COVID, it is usually associated with myocardial damage and cardiac arrhythmias. And you have to monitor the drug toxicity which are used in COVID-19 infection. The cardiovascular involvement comprises mainly of indirect myocardial injury, which is because of severe inflammatory uh, response to the COVID-19 infection and hemodynamic changes due to extensive respiratory involvement leading to hypoxia, which further increase the myocardial injury. However, about 20% cases it has been demonstrated that the direct myocardial injury is also important. In the presence of myocarditis, because it is known that COVID-19 can lead to acute myocarditis, not acute, subacute myocarditis, and delayed myocarditis. The stress cardiomyopathy is known to increase by three times when it is compared to pre-COVID era. The possible is, yes, yes, COVID-19, now it is very clear that it lead to possible ACS because of two mechanisms, increased thromboembolic phenomena or because of rupture of atherosclerotic plaque. It has been shown that atherosclerotic plaques become more vulnerable to rupture during COVID-19 infection. It may lead to cardiac arrhythmia and it may lead to sudden cardiac death. Thrombosis to various organs, pulmonary thromboembolism is the very important cause of morbidity and mortality. And bleeding because you have a thrombosis and higher bleeding because of thrombocytopenia, because of platelet malfunction. So you have a combination of these two things which is occurring in acute COVID infection. Heart failure and cardiac shock is the last severe manifestation of cardiovascular involvement. This is very, very important. COVID-19 infect, infection per se may lead to increased biomarker level, which is for cardiac uh, abnormality. You have elevated troponin level without acute myocarditis, with, without ACS. So 
elevated troponin level is not 100% correlate with myocardial damage. But it has been demonstrated that if you have a higher cardiac troponin level in COVID-19 infection, you are, have a very high chances of other morbidity and mortality. Pro-BMP level without even heart failure can be raised. So if patient is breathless because of lung problem, his BMP is high, you, you should suspect if you are a strong that patient is heart failure, it should be taken as a pinch of salt. We have seen BMP level of 30,000 with normal eco, and on CT scan, it is not heart failure, but more so where a patchy distribution, always confusing because sometimes you may have a hypertension, you give diuretics, it's further deteriorate electrolyte imbalance. You have increased D-dimer level, increased ferritin level, and LDH level. Believe it, increased D-dimer because it is sometimes very difficult to measure D-dimer level. So even D-dimer is low, you can have increased ch chances of thrombosis. But invariably, in majority of the patient, if there's a moderate to severe COVID, the D-dimer will be increased. Myocardial injury and acute myocarditis can mimic ACS. That is very, very important. You have a ST elevation, you may have increased enzyme, but you take this patient to angiogram and coronaries are normal. So you have to be very cautious in making the diagnosis of uh, uh, AC, acute coronary syndrome in presence of raise and some STT changes. There's always a delayed presentation of ST EMI because People think that it is because of COVID changes, but actually patient is having STEMI. And we all know that the COVID increase due to balloon time. The thrombolysis is always preferred in various hospitals. But mind it, if you are doing an intervention, primary PCI, thrombolysis, the coagulation parameters are often deranged. So be cautious. You have an increased chance of thrombosis. You have an increased chance of bleeding. And you don't know which patient will bleed, which patient will have increased chances of thrombosis. There's a lot of drugs which are used in treatment of COVID, which can lead to cardiac toxicity. Antiviral drugs like lopinavir and ritonavir increases the QT interval and prolong the PR. The rivavirin, which is being used, can lead to an increase in warfarin dosing. Lopinavir and ritonavir can reduce the, uh, avoid, uh, the, reduce the effect of riroxabane and apixabane. If you are giving the lipanavir and ritonavir, though they are not used in India, but invariably it is used in Western country, it can increase serum concentration of ticagrol. However, there's only one drug, which is prasogil, which is on the study, has not shown to change its behavior during COVID infection and antiviral treatment. Don't give lopanavir, ritonavir with statins because it causes a lot of myopathy. Lovastatin and sevastatin are contraindicated in COVID-19. That's being written that it may cause rhabdomyolysis. If you are giving a torva and rosuva, give in very low doses. You have to avoid QT longer. And if you are giving this QT longer, monitor the ECG like SCQ, azithromycin, and amidron. And risk of toxicity pointing increases if you have electrolyte imbalance, hepatic inner failure, structural heart disease. And one thing, though it has been believed that if you block the ACE receptor, uh, 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 if you give an ACE and ARB, theoretically, it will increase the infection of COVID, but the study has shown that ARB and a a ACS are, are going to help in COVID patient rather than cause deterioration. Now, this is a very good algorithm. I'm not going to describe this algorithm, but uh, the Cardiology Society has, uh, of India has given a very good al algorithm of management of STEMI patient in this COVID era. In congenital heart disease, yes, the, the patient has having congenital heart disease, they are more prone for complications because they have a limited cardiovascular reserve. And there is a Kawasaki-like presentation also seen in these patients. These are the ECG abnormalities. Sinus tachycardia present is approximately more than 70% of the cases. You may have a baseline QT prolongation, which may be because of drug, and per se, COVID infection is shown to increase the QT interval. You may have a lot of STT abnormalities. Atrial fibrillation has been reported up to 10% of cases. VT up to 3% of cases. The classical finding of S1, QT, 3T, a pulmonary embolism. Brugada pattern has been shown. And there's increased incidence of AV block during COVID infection. Now come the post-COVID condition. Post-COVID conditions has a wide range of new returning or ongoing health problems. 
of a patient who has experienced the COVID. One thing is very important. If even patient who did not have any symptoms of COVID-19 during the index infection. It simply means that patient is asymptomatic. He was diagnosed to have COVID. They have shown to develop post-COVID conditions. These post-COVID conditions are often called long COVID, long haul COVID, post-acute COVID-19, long-term effect of COVID or chronic COVID, whatever you name, these all belongs to the same category. And this is a beautiful diagram which depicts the stages of COVID. Acute COVID stage lasts up to four weeks. Then there was a sub-acute or ongoing COVID which lasts up to 12 weeks. And after that, there's a chronic or post-COVID. And believe me, practically each and every important organ is involved in post-COVID care, starting from a generalized fatigue, dyspnea, cough, persistent oxygen requirement, anxiety, depression, up to 50% of the patient has severe neurological problem, sleep disturbances, headache, palpitation, chest pain, thrombolism, kidney failure, and now hair loss is coming in up to 20% of the cases in post-COVID part. Now, these post-COVID symptoms are attributed mainly because of persistent infection, autonomous imbalance, and direct cardiotoxicity or toxicity of the lung and neurological, uh, the CNS. Now, these are the four or five important cardiovascular symptoms which comes in post-COVID part. Breathing difficulty, tiredness and fatigue, symptoms that get worse after physical activity, palpitation, dizziness or standing, and chest pain. Now, coming to the various, I have really searched and uh, believe me, after reading all this, I find that practically 50% patient who has a moderate to severe COVID have some important severe post-COVID symptom. This study included about 600 patients, six-month follow-up. This is the left column shows the symptoms during the COVID and the red column shows symptoms after six months. And see the anos anosmia, the fatigue, neurological symptoms, the uh, dyspnea, it's very, very important up to 50% cases. So about 40% has a high burden of symptoms, more than two. And if you see the patient who has a mild to moderate, mild, asymptomatic and mild COVID versus moderate, severe and critical COVID, these symptoms are found in more in moderate, severe or critical COVID. This study published in Annals, 60 days outcome among patients hospitalized with COVID-19, about 1,700 patients, 500 follow-up. Again, 32% patients report persistent symptoms. Dyspnea, 22, cuff, 15. Persistent loss of weight, 13. The most important thing, really half report emotional effect by their health. Out of 19 patients, out of the patients who are employed before, about one-third cannot join even after six months to their employment because of ongoing health issues. This is again a study of COVID uh, after six months, which shows again fatigue 53, dyspnea 43, joint pain 27. And they say in 143 patients up to 87% patient after 60 days will have some form of the system. Again, six months, a large study comprises of 2000 patients. And they again show that muscle weakness and fatigue up to 63% sleep difficulty in 26% cases, and anxiety and depression in 23% cases. Again, in a larger study, in a non-critical COVID, this study has done in a non-critical, mild to moderate, mild to moderate COVID. And again, in day 60, 66% 66 patient are having anosmia, dyspnea, or asthenia. This is a seven month of symptoms and their impact. 56 countries were involved. It's a questionnaire-based study. Again, what they saw, about 77% patients are having fatigue or post exertion malaise or cognitive dysfunction. Even after seven months, 85% experience relapse of these symptoms when they exert, when they do exercise, when they do a physical or mental activity. So even after seven months, more than two thirds of the patient will have some form of fatigue in these patients. Again, a long study, COVID persisting symptoms. Sorry. And they found, again, more than 70% patients will have some form of uh, symptoms after six months. And that is important. About 10% will have persistent lymphopenia. 
thirty percent will have elevated D-dimer after sixty days, and ten percent will have elevated uh, uh, CRP, and majority will have an abnormal X-ray. Again, cardiovascular. This is a very good study done in hundred patients, and they have done a cardiac MRI. They are all patients. Only thirty-three percent patient was hospitalized. Sixty-six percent in home. They are mild to severe COVID. Hundred patient after seventy-one days, MRI was done. Believe it. The MRI involvement was found in seventy-eight percent of the cases in a form of some form of myocarditis and ongoing myocardial inflammation in sixty percent. Again, this study, which is done in a recovered 26 competitive college athlete who are absolutely mild symptomatic or asymptomatic. MRI was done in this patient and about 12, 46% has a evidence of myocarditis or prior myocardial injury in cardiac MRI imaging. Though there are some uh, conflicting evidence also, they say this uh, MRI positivity may not translate into long-term myocarditis or heart failure, but it is a very significant finding. These all are manifestation of COVID, post-COVID symptoms involving from lung, hematological, cardiovascular, neuropsychiatric, renal, endocrine, gastro, dermatology, and a lot of miscellaneous. And these are the most important cardiovascular manifestation post-COVID they present usually with palpitation, dyspnea, chest pain, and orthostatic symptoms. Long-term sequelae, increased cardiometabolic demand, increased incidence of stress, myocardial fibrosis, scarring, arrhythmia, tachycardia, and autonomous dysfunction. This is very important. We have now found a lot of evidence that COVID-19 can lead to sudden cardiac death. And these are the proposed mechanism for sudden cardiac death in COVID era, it may be because of myocarditis, acute coronary syndrome, hypoxia, coagulation disorder, cardiac tamponade, electrolyte imbalance, and arrhythmogenicity because of drug or direct involvement of myocardium. This is very, very important. In the next three or four slides, I will be finishing my talk. Autonomous dysfunction in long COVID. And now we are finding a lot of patients who were on 3-3 antihypertensive drug and their blood pressure came to 100. We have to practically stop all the antihypertensive drugs. This is known as orthostatic intolerance syndrome, which includes three important components, orthostatic hypertension, vasovagal syncope, or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, known as POTS. Because we, now it has been demonstrated that COVID-19 infection affects the autonomous function test. So any patients, if they present with breathlessness, palpitation, but they give history of pre-syncope or syncope, should be evaluated carefully. An active stand test should be, I will say, please do, if the patient is symptomatic, please do active standing test in all patients. Measure blood pressure and heart rate while five minutes lying supine, then make them stand and do the blood pressure and pulse rate after three minutes of standing. So if they have more than 20 millimeter systolic and more than 10 millimeter diastolic fall, all their heart rate increases by 30 beats per minute or more when standing for more than 30 seconds and 40 beats uh, or more in those days, 12 to 90, it is leveled as a POTS or orthostatic intolerance syndrome. And what is the treatment? Because it's very difficult to treat. Reinsurance and education is the most important. Don't make them panic. Just tell them to do some uh, structural aerobic and anaerobic exercise. As orthostasis may be problem, do a non-upright exercise. Patient may be lying down, do a cycling, do anything. Fluid and salt intake, increase their full fluid and salt repletion until they have a LV dysfunction, past history of heart failure. I always say during COVID and post-COVID for six months, increase your salt and water intake. Avoid exer uh, exacerbating factors like advice on rising cautiously from the lying down. You should be in a warm environment, avoid dehydration should be avoided. Additionally, patient can be advised to consume a small and frequent meal rather than large meal, and it is being seen when patient, when patient take a large meal, he has a postural hypertension and syncope. So advise them because it will avoid spanking vasodilatation. Isometric exercises are very, very important. Compressive garments are very, very important in this situation. So if they have an arthrosic hypertension or parts, advise them to put a compressive garment. And this uh, garment should extend to the waist or abdominal binders. It should not be limited to below knee. The drugs may be used if it is uh, very symptomatic in fludrocortisone. Uh, Midodron has been used. 
patient should be uh, avoid. Uh, one thing is very, very important. We advise patient to lie down, but if there's an arthrostatic hypertension, advise them to avoid supine position as much as possible. Sit in the chair. And if it's still very much symptomatic, and if there's a pot, a beta blocker, and usually propanol is preferred. If you have a pot, inappropriate sinus tachycardia, we prefer propanol. And now there's some study which has shown that evabradine has got a very good result in this situation. So an area which, what an area which required further investigation because the COVID cardiovascular manifestation and coming in a huge way. So we have a myocardial injury and a prognostic value of proponent need to be further studied. That raised open because a lot of controversial studies has come. Role of cardiac MRI. If a cardiac MRI find about 70% ongoing myocardial arteries after 71 days, probably cardiac MRI, but it's still not recommended in all patients until you suspect strong myocardial arteries. That is very, very important. A athlete or a patient or a child who's playing, how early he should return to his athlete does it require further investigation? Because study has shown 45% are having myocarditis. So whether it is required, whether ECO is sufficient, there's a lot of data coming by spec tracking after 60 days, 90 days, and they find abnormal ECO, though its LV function is normal. And important thing, what are long COVID? Prevalence of long COVID in a large. What is exact prevalence? We are not doing our study. Indian studies are very deficient, but we are finding a lot of patients how to manage their symptoms. That is very, very important. And now you believe a lot of viruses are coming. The increased cytomegalovirus, increased incidence of tuberculosis. Maybe there may be increased uh, surge of HIV in these patients. So it is coming in India in very high wave. So this all required a lot of investigation and the efficacy of POTS therapy because sometimes POTS is very troublesome. So an impact of long COVID over the psychological well-being of in these patients need to be further investigated. So to conclude my talk, the latest observational pathological imaging clinical studies has tried to clarify, has not clarified still, the short-term and long-term impact of COVID-19 on cardiovascular system. Myocardial injury in COVID-19 appear to be predominantly mediated by severity of critical illness rather than direct myocardial involvement. Autonomous dysfunction is common and very troublesome. Role of MRI, though I think may be a future investigation in all COVID moderate to severe, but still not validated and not advisable. But the biggest problem in our country is in COVID is that there's again lack of uniform scientific health resources, infrastructure for all level, poverty, overcrowding, poor sanitation, public awareness, life versus livelihood, unnecessary fear, and social stigma with COVID-19 is going to inhibit the medical practitioner for post-COVID management. And now there's a lot of recommendation coming from CDC, WHO, that post-COVID treatment should be given by the primary level physician, not a tertiary level physician, because it is going to be a very, very important and major problem in near future. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Rakesh. Dr. Yeah, Shivananda, Dr. Dipisina. Yeah, that's a quite an exhaustive lecture, which has covered nearly all the aspects of the post-COVID yeah. scenario which has been alarming to the uh, uh, Western cardiologist. In India, we lack data. But the uh, thing is, is that uh, the post-COVID sudden cardiac death, what is the problem in India? Can you elaborate it? Deep? Yes, sir. I, I have written an editorial Indian Heart Journal. I'm absolutely thinking that it may not be there. But I find in my practice, in my knowledge, a lot of patients are dying suddenly after two months, three months of COVID infection. And probably the cause may be what why believe it two or three phases. Jain it may be either a myocarditis. Second important Arisha. thing, uh, it may be it may be because of increased thromboembolic episodes, which is leading to ACS, or it may be because of postural hypotension. So yes, it is a problem, and every but there is nothing which can come as a study purpose. However, there are a lot of studies done in Western country. They find that sudden cardiac death incidence has increased drastically during the COVID period. So there is indirect evidence. There is, uh, you, you are knowing that patient is discharged, everything was fine, suddenly he died. So it is a problem and uh, it required more investigations, more study, but probably we are not going to get a lot of study on that. Just I want to 
congratulate Rakesh for his very lucid and informative talks. He has covered all the aspects. And by the meantime, we know that it is uh, not only a respiratory or viral pneumonia, but different cardiovascular manifestations have been uh, elaborated by Rakesh. And uh, uh, Dr. Sina can do his comment, what he was telling. Dr. Yeah. Sina, please. Yeah, the last comment. Dr. Rakesh, yeah. in view of your lecture and uh, thanks for pointing out there's a lot of sudden cardiac death, which could be due to uh, coronary thrombosis. But in a previous lecture, you heard that uh, using of uh, oral anticoagulants, coagulants, the patrolly, the is um, not exactly found to be beneficial. Your personal practice on it. What could be to you, Jaimar? You give a or yes. Now, 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 I all be, I believe in a practice. I say if your D-dimer is raised, you have at least moderate to severe COVID. You have to give NOAC for at least one month. People have extended it to say six, say, sorry, uh, six week also. Now there is a strong belief, though the data is controversial. Even you have a mild COVID, and if your D-dimer is slightly high people start giving aspirin to all patients. A lot of physicians I have seen that they start giving aspirin to all the patients. But definitely, if you have a moderate to severe, your D-dimer is high, I will give Rivaroxaban because 10 milligram is a low dose. There's a very less bleeding complication. So, but in my practice, I will prefer to give for a one month, at least. And if there is a high comorbidity, it's a diabetic, I will extend to six weeks. Thank you, Dr. Thank Rakesh. You. Thank you.